Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I hope you had a wonderful Memorial Day holiday and you did not eat a single thing that I wouldn't eat. Okay, I'm counting on that, all of you out there, right? Okay, as usual, a few announcements. Um, summer semester starts next week, so if you're going to take the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course with our celebrity instructors like John McDougall and Neil Barnard and Caldwell Esselstyn, about now is when you need to get your paperwork in for that. Uh, we're offering some other classes summer semester too, like um, maternal and pediatric nutrition and um, nutrition and cardiovascular disease, microbiology. So check it out. And then um, hopefully you are taking the Informed Medical Consumer Series. We had a workshop on Tuesday. Tonight is the next one and we recorded them. So if you missed it, you remember this is part of your benefits. You definitely want to take advantage of it. So if you missed Tuesday night's call or if you're going to miss tonight's, you can access the recording by just calling the office and finding out how. All right, I have a couple topics to talk about, and uh, we'll start with outbreaks of whooping cough um, have been recorded in 49 states over the last few years, and there's a whole lot of chatter about why this is happening. And of course, a lot of what appears on the mainstream press is the reason for the outbreaks of whooping cough and other diseases is, of course, that very small percentage of parents who choose not to vaccinate their children. Now, I've never understood this argument. Because if the vaccine actually worked, a vaccinated child exposed to a child who's not been vaccinated, who has whooping cough, shouldn't make any difference if the vaccine worked. But um, the reality is common sense doesn't prevail in this discussion. And uh, research continually points to the idea that many of these vaccines don't work as well as they're promised. So um, I'm going to talk about a relatively new and published in pediatrics, looked at the efficacy of Tdap, which contains the vaccine for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, or whooping cough. And the study looked at reported cases of pertussis in seven counties in Washington state between January 1 and June, June 30th of 2012, and then comparing them with vaccination records. The researchers reported, and I, this blew me away when I read this, that the estimated vaccine efficacy for pertussis is 73% within a year of vaccination, 55% at 12 to 23 months, and by 24 to 47 months, only 34%. And they actually wrote this in the article. Lack of long-term protection after vaccination is likely contributing to increases in uh, pertussis among adolescents. I mean, clear acknowledgement that this vaccine does not work. I mean, what are we supposed to do? Get more vaccines every five years for all of them? I mean, it's, uh, you know, anyway. The Advisory Committee for Vaccine Practices, or ASIP, recommends that this Tdap vaccine be given at 2, 4, 6, and 12 months, and then, and uh, what I think was an acknowledgement that there was a problem, started recommending in 2005 that kids get the vaccines again um, when they're 11 to 12 years old. And, um, but in spite of all that, the uh, number of reported pertussis cases re in the United States reached a 67-year high in 2012, which resulted in ASAP no longer recommending the booster shot for 11 and 12-year-olds, and instead they focused their attention on pregnant women. Now, there's no evidence that vaccinating pregnant women for whooping cough makes a difference either, but a common ploy of the vaccine industry is when the research shows that the vaccine's ineffective for one population, they just shift and market it to another population. We saw that for years with flu vaccines. I don't know if you remember, but there was uh, one year when the vaccine was in short supply and elderly people couldn't get the flu vaccine and nothing happened. Everybody, everybody was waiting for all the older people to drop dead. Nothing happened. And so the next year, the CDC and the drug companies started marketing vaccines for babies and, and small children. That, they just targeted that audience. There always has to be somebody out there you can scare into doing this. Well, the problem is obviously not the small percentage of unvaccinated children. The problem is that vaccines, most of them are effective for very limited periods of time. And this is very important information right now. One of the reasons I'm talking about this issue is that in many states, there are laws pending that would require um, kids to be vaccinated to enter school. They want to get rid of all the religious and, and philosophical exemptions, which most states have, and require kids to be vaccinated. And there is one law that's been proposed federally uh, for, by Congress that would require uh, schools in order to get reimbursement from uh, the feds uh, to show that the, the vaccination rate was 100%. Well, this is essentially martial law for vaccines, and if they can do it for kids sooner or later, they'll be forcing you and I to get vaccinated. I I think we've got to scream and holler about this until everybody hears our voice. And by the way, um, one tip, and I've done a lot of work in this 
this area, don't send emails. Make phone calls and send paper mail. One of the problems in lobbying our elected officials right now is people send emails, and I've sat in the offices of many legislators. Guess how many of those emails they see? Almost none. But when you send paper mail, and there's so much mail that they can't walk from the door to their desk, this is what they pay attention to. So you get you and your friends to send actual physical mail. I know it's a really outdated idea. I'm so old-fashioned for proposing it, but there you have it. I'm telling you, send mail. All right, let's talk about something a little more positive. Uh, well, I mean, this is positive if we win this battle, right? It's going to be positive. We are going to win this battle. Of course we will. All right, according to a new study, when you change your diet, either for the better or worse, the composition of your gut bacteria will change in only two weeks, which will increase or decrease your risk of colon cancer, depending upon which dietary pattern you adopt. The study that um, I'm talking about involved 20 African Americans living in Pittsburgh and 20 rural South Africans who were asked to change their diets for two weeks. So what happened was the Americans ate a South African rural diet. Lots of fiber, low in fat, lots of foods like vegetables, beans, and cornmeal, not much animal food. The Africans, on the other hand, were instructed to eat the standard American diet, high in fat, lots of meat and cheese. Lead author Stephen O'Keefe, a gastroenterologist, said, this is a quote, we made them eat fried chicken, burgers, and fries. They loved it. Well, of course they loved it. And therein lies the problem. Once people taste these foods and get a taste for them, they want a whole lot more of it. All right, so we can write off 20 more Africans who've converted now to the American diet who are going to have problems. Well, after only two weeks, the researchers performed colonoscopies on all the participants, and here's what happened. The African Americans who were eating the traditional African diet showed in just two weeks reduced inflammation in the colon and increased production of butyrate, a fatty acid shown to be protective against colon cancer. The opposite happened with the rural Africans eating the American diet. There were negative changes in their gut bacteria that indicated an increased risk of colon cancer. So these results help to explain the vast differences in the colon cancer rates in various parts of the world. You know, diseases are still pretty much geographically distributed. You look at westernized countries like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, high rates of degenerative conditions like all forms of cancer and um, heart disease and type 2 diabetes. You go into rural Africa, many parts of the Asian countries, very low rates. It's the diet, folks. It's actually the diet. And I had an opportunity to see this firsthand, by the way. I was in South Africa in 2011 with Dr. Campbell. We did some lectures for both doctors and for the uh, general public. And um, we also got to go into rural areas and the townships, and we saw the way the less um, uh, economically advantaged people uh, lived and ate. They were all living on fruits and vegetables and plant food because that's what they could afford. But 25 minutes away in the major cities, people eating the standard American diet. Our trip was sponsored in part by an insurance company and the CEO of the company spent a lot of time with us during the time that we were there and said that the reimbursement system in South Africa is becoming just as burdened, overburdened, as the reimbursement system in the United States because of the incredible increase in degenerative diseases because of the fascination with the Western diet. Uh, by the way, my research also showed that the government rec recommendations, I did a lot of research before I went over there to give my talks, and um, the government recommendations are not quite as terrible as here in the United States, but there's a specific recommendation by the government to eat meat. It's the best way to get your protein, the whole nine yards. So we have many of the same things going on there that we had going on here. In fact, at the time that I was getting ready to go, I thought I was gonna to have to do like lots of changes to my slide presentations to make them relevant. I didn't have to do that at all. The recommendations I just put, you know, took off USDA, put in South African government. It was so similar. And, you know, Mer Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in the United States, all the conflicts of interest within with industry, just replaced that slide with the South African Dietetic Association, same conflicts. I mean, it really is astoundingly similar. So. The bottom line, though, for this research is that um, there's, it, it really shows how quickly health status can change. You know, so if you're not healthy, if you haven't been eating a health-promoting diet, do it. Within a very short period of time, your health will improve. Two weeks, your, your markers are better for colon cancer. But if you're deciding to, to stray and misbehave, and again, I hope you didn't do that on Memorial Day, but if you do that, very quickly, things go downhill. Two weeks and for, you know, better or uh, deep um, markers for colon cancer appearing that weren't there before. So um, 
let's get everybody improving their health. I mean, the results are quicker than drugs. You can improve your health quicker with diet than you can with drugs. Let's keep that in mind. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And next week, we'll be back to two broadcasts because we don't have the holiday uh, at the beginning of the week. Have a great rest of the week and weekend.